Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 292. Disruption. This vlog comes by request from Kylie. Hi Kylie, you've been a wonderful supporter through these vlogs so I'm thrilled to deliver this for you. But Kylie said to me, she's got a problem that all these people before the pandemic and during the pandemic were talking about disruption and the power and the energy and the importance of disruption. And Kylie hates disruption. So she wrote to me to try and understand this and asked me to try and sort this disruption thing out. So Kylie, I'm absolutely thrilled to do that for you. And look, I have some interest in this area, a lot of interest in this area, I've published in this area. And of course this is a pandemic story, certainly, but disruption is also a story about our universities in crisis that predates the pandemic by decades. Now I've been interested in, hell, I've been laughing at people who talk about disruption for decades. And just to give you an example, just before the pandemic, so we're talking November 2019, two very senior managers in an Australian university with their posh accents and their posh suits talked about in this meeting the importance, the, the power of disruption and the importance of making staff and students feel disrupted and on edge and confused and questioning themselves and the interesting thing is, as they were talking about the importance of disrupting academics and disrupting students, they were laughing uh, as they were offering this imperative. You know, quote, disruption is great. We need to unsettle students, unsettle staff. We need to unsettle our organisation because we need change now. End of quote. November 2019. Bless. Now, of course, that phrase and this agenda is absolute nonsense. And when it actually happened in real time at this big meeting, I laughed. I sort of did my slightly banshee-esque laugh because I thought it was terribly funny. And I laughed and I said, quote, wow, I haven't heard anybody talk about disruption like this since the early 1990s. Do tell us your plan. End of quote. Now, what was interesting when I actually laughed, and the power of laughter is always important, when I laughed and then said, okay, disruption, tell us what you're gonna do, tell us the plan. They were silent, deathly silent. And they both looked down, blushed a bit, and looked like to be experiencing shame. So what had happened here is that the senior leaders had validated particular words like disruption and they'd been validated through their career by doing that. That's how they had become senior leaders. Disruption, disruption, disruption. And disempowered people, people who had to do what they asked them to do because they were disempowered, had to nod and agree with them through their career because they had to do as they were told to get a salary. So when someone actually confronts them and say, says, I'm sorry, you are talking absolute rubbish, that notion of disruption has been critiqued for 30 years, then they simply had no next stage. There was no policy or agenda or procedure to activate disruption. So you see what's happening here. This word disruption is not actually a word. It's an entire sentence. In fact, it's a whole approach to thinking about the world. So therefore, let's go into disruption and work out what's occurring here. So we've just got two very simple parts to the vlog today. The first is I'm going to talk about disruption and how it has been actioned in our universities. Then my second part, I'm going to look at how the pandemic has changed our very understanding of disruption and indeed, our very understanding of universities. So disruption is a really serious word, right? It refers to a breakage. 
It is an abrupt intervention. Now it comes from the Latin disruption, fracture, break. Now paradigm and disruption, these two words do have a relationship, right? So paradigm comes from Thomas Kuhn, obviously, and he explored models, archetypes, examples. So a paradigm can be, and frequently is, forceful. What a paradigm does, a paradigm shift obviously, what a paradigm does is it forces a change and it forces the opening up of new possibilities. That's a paradigm. Now disruption is different. What disruption is, is it is a cut, an intervention in the current model. Right? Paradigm creates a change to think about the next paradigm. Disruption is simply cutting up the current model. And we have to understand really how the pandemic has radically, radically transformed what we think of as disruption and indeed its value. So let me talk about the great new research that's emerged from David Potter in his remarkable book, Disruption, why things change. I recommend it to you, published in 2021. Now, Potter made a really powerful argument, brilliant. He argued that dominant groups affirm and argue for the importance of change. Now, why? Right, well, disruption acts, disruptive acts, are acts of self-interest. Disruption is enacted by the powerful to increase their power. But of course, what happens is they activate disruption to supposed to increase their power, but the disruption doesn't increase their power because they don't know what's going to happen after the disruption takes place. You with me? So they think that the disruption. Uh, is going to increase their power and actually it doesn't increase their power it increases the instability the trauma the fear and the confusion over time and invariably disruption leads to what can be called an interregnum that is an interruption between power structures so one powerful entity has emerged a disruption is activated, could be lots of things, an interregnum emerge, emerges, which is a gap between two power structures. Okay, moving from one power group, a bit of a gap, bit of a problem, bit of instability, and then the next power structure. So, as you can see, the empowered love disruption, but they just simply cannot manage the consequences of it. So, disruption is a short-term entity. And the trouble is the word disruption blocks longer term thinking, strategies, policies, plans. So we have all these leaders before the pandemic in higher education talking about disruption, 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 disruption. Then the disruption actually happened and they had no skills to manage it at all. So the shambles that many of our universities are in around the world. That shambles has emerged because leaders wanted disruption, edgy, trendy, ooh, a bit confrontational, a bit edgy. And then when an actual disruption occurred, they didn't have the skill set to manage it. Okay, so basically those in power, and this is an historical entity here, those in power use disruption as a sharp knife and it's used to cut up and carve up the disempowered so that their power can increase. But they lose control of the situation and the resulting chaos increases the instability rather than their power. Powerful argument, isn't it? So before COVID-19, all sorts of journalists, and consultants and the leadership literature used phrases like, quote, recognizing opportunity in uncertainty, end of quote. We got used to those sort of cliches, didn't we? 
So the goal is always to sort of unsettle us, keeping us all a bit unstable, frightened, confused. Instead of that particular way of thinking, I just want to take a breath, perhaps an interregnum, and acknowledge and extend L.P. Hartley's The Go-Betweens. The first sentence of this masterwork was, quote, <laughs> The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. End of quote. For me, though, to extend that analysis, that argument, the future is also a foreign country. They do things differently there. So what we need to do, colleagues, is actually live in our present. Live in our present. Breathe our present. Understand our present. Now, disruption tries to stop us living in the present. Reading the evidence, understanding the information, activating information literacy and offering an interpretation for a structured change. Disruption works from the premise that the present doesn't matter. Let's cut it up. Let's agitate it. And if we attack the present enough, then you know what? A better future will arrive. This is wrong. So if we're interested in creating a better future, and that's why most of us do research, if we're interested in creating a better future, then we need to work on and in the present rather than destroying it. The word disruption is used to critique our inability to embrace the new. So particular models of leadership use disruption because the workers, we just don't want change. We can't manage change, so they have to disrupt us to force change upon us. Right. Let's prove them wrong. Let's prove them wrong. All of this talk about disruption underestimates who we are and what we can achieve as researchers, as teachers, and as citizens. We can change without disrupting all our systems. We are smart, and we can use problem solving, and collaboration, and partnerships without destroying our systems. Now, if you think about it, so many of the vlogs that we've shared in the last five and a half years, we've been thinking about the changes in our workplaces, the changing nature of work, if you will. And therefore, I've focused very strongly on you, on us, and thinking about professional development, thinking about learning cultures. And there are reasons for that. Because if you continue to learn, if you enact professional development, then you are ahead of the changes. So you're working on technology, you're thinking about change. So you've done the work before you go to work. Right. So some of the articles that I've been reading for this week had really bonkers titles. I mean, I just had a list of, I think, about 55 articles. And... You know, they, they were basically a title. There was no content there. But the titles were stuff like, quote, digital disruption and why you need to be upskilling now, end of quote. Look, seriously, if you ever see the word upskilling, just laugh, right? Upskill, yeah, upskill, girlfriend, upskill. And when you put digital disruption and upskilling in the same sentence, uh, we all just need to calm the farm and, and have a nice glass of water and do some yogic breathing. Okay, so disruption has been too closely aligned with digitization particularly and technology more generally. And if I can offer one maxim for your consideration, technology does not matter. Really, technology does not matter. How technology exists in context 
That's crucial. Technology is just technology. Technology in social systems creates change. So as you can see, disruption is not always positive. Most of the time, disruption is not positive. And of course, technological change is not always possible and is quite frequently not beneficial. Always be conscious, be careful. When anyone in a position of power in your life uses the word disruption, it is a word with an edge. It is a word with an agenda. And it floats about and it's used as an imperative, but it has no content, no policy, no procedure. It's just a sharp knife that's coming at you. It is a word and it's used to force living, breathing humans into business models. So the last little bit of this vlog is going to summon the pandemic and show how the pandemic has radically transformed, radically changed our understanding of disruption. And I'll show you why. So what's happened is during the pandemic, the word disruption, and not surprisingly, has lost its sheen. Much of the global population had a first hand look at the impact of disruption. Now, obviously, people died. Millions of people died. And articles through the pandemic started to appear with titles like, quote, Nine Tips to Minimise Disruption During the Pandemic. End of quote. So as you can see, the language started to change. And we started to hear a very interesting phrase emerge the new normal the new normal so the post pandemic the new normal is a craving for reliability predictability understanding the world once more to stop living in fear now you'll notice the pandemic promoted new industries. So online grocery shopping was a great example. Virtual healthcare was great, telehealth. And of course, a whole series of, of home nesting industries. So IKEA, furniture, home-based technologies, Netflix. <laughs> and of course, jigsaw puzzles were the great, was the great story of the pandemic as well. So home nesting objects. But other things have occurred through this new normal. We've got a wave of resignations, demands to work from home, to work flexibly, and a recognition of the profound inefficiencies of the previous working system. The work-life balance cliche just ain't gonna cut us anymore. Therefore, the pandemic has created a radical change in how disruption is understood. The empowered, the empowered, did not use disruption in the pandemic as a tool on the disempowered. Instead, the disempowered experienced a pandemic of disruption. And the consequences of that was startling because citizens, workers, scholars started to realise how pointless most of our lives are. Ole Jensen has published a stunning paper in the journal Mobilities. I've recommended that journal to you a lot in the last five and a half years and two weeks ago in the journal Mobilities, Jensen produced an incredible article titled, quote, Pandemic Disruption, Extended Bodies and Elastic Situations, Reflections on COVID-19 and Mobilities, end of quote. Stunning article, stunning. Now Jensen has confirmed the radical role 
of the pandemic in quote, creating a reflection upon the often taken for granted nature of mobilities and the contemporary city, end of quote. Now, this is a key argument. The pandemic, the disruption, has meant that all of us have started to reflect on what we take for granted. Now, this means that disruption can never really be used again as a tool of the empowered to initiate change for no other reason except to initiate change. We're starting to see in the refereed literature talking about the new normal in our universities. Now, Chapara et al. in the International Journal of Higher Education, again in the last month, explored the impact of COVID-19 on the Peruvian university system. Fine article. And Chapara et al. showed how the disruption to face-to-face -face university teaching was, and they described it as deadly to our institutions. Academics scrambled with little training, with little PD, to try and make online learning work. So 20 years of disruption of professional development to help academics be better teachers because there was no funding source, no care for academics and online learning in the last 20 years. Suddenly when it was needed, our colleagues around the world suffered and wow, they had a good go at trying to make it work. But those academics will never be the same again, never. And there was the teaching mess through COVID. And then, of course, there's the bizarre situation with research, where research and the KPIs were expected to continue through COVID, while researchers were homeschooling. So research continues, even though labs are closing, and people are trying to educate their kids at home. So as the economic loss of international students became clear, and remember most universities around the world have balanced their economic books by the incredible value of international students. Now I think international students are incredibly valuable because we need a global education system. But of course the fees that international students brought into our universities allowed the books to be balanced. So suddenly, when the inverted commas, easy money from international students started to dry up, the true economic state of our universities became clear. And at that point, casual staff were lost. Contract staff were lost and now permanent staff are lost. So today, we are not dealing with the same university sector we were two years ago. We're not. We've all seen the cost of disruption, all of us. And we know, we know that disruption is not productive. But what we also now know is disruption can be a word of reflection, an opportunity to think about the relationship between the past, the present and the future in our lives and in our societies. So <laughs> ironically, disruption is productive in ways that the empowered cannot even begin to understand because disruption creates reflection. And we are not the same people we were, are we? We see things clearly now. I wish you love light and peace. Tear.